and welcome to the University of Queensland School of Architecture public lecture series, North by Northwest, Local and Global Architectural Culture, which is hosted by the State Library of Queensland as a component of their year-long Asia-Pacific Design Library lecture series. My name's Naomi Stead. I'm a research fellow at the University of Queensland School of Architecture, and it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, my friend and collaborator, Justine Clark. Justine, these days, is an independent editor, writer, critic, curator, and researcher, but as many of you will know, she was up until very recently, in fact, last month, editor of Architecture Australia, having been associated with that journal since 2000, first as assistant editor, then as deputy editor, and uh, as editor from 2004 to 2011. Uh, it's a huge responsibility, I think, to be uh, the editor of Architecture Australia and to curate effectively, to curate architecture in Australia, how it's communicated, how it will be remembered. But I think, in my opinion, Justine's tenure as editor of AA was marked by intellectual seriousness, uh, a depth of discourse, and a commitment to public debate about architecture, including on several occasions here in Brisbane, and a reflexive approach to what is architectural criticism and what is it to edit a major national journal. Uh, her work at Architecture Australia was recognised in 2009 with the uh, award of the Bates Smart Award for Architecture in the Media for the AA issue on Indigenous housing. Justine has also been active on the world stage as a three times... Uh, judge of the World Architecture Awards. She's also engaged in scholarly research and is a partner investigator on an Australian Research Council linkage grant entitled Equity and Diversity in the Australian Architecture Profession, Women, Work and Leadership. That project is in collaboration with me and uh, it's based at the University of Queensland Architecture School it had, along with six other scholars from five other institutions and five industry partners including the Institute of Architects. I think Justine's commitment to social justice and public policy generation is also a very commendable attribute. Justine is co-author with Paul Walker of the book Looking for the Local, Architecture and the New Zealand Modern. This is, I think, a really wonderful book and a collector's item these days. I have to say, I don't have a copy and it's out of print. So if anyone has one. Um, Justine was also curator of the exhibition of the same name and has curated other architectural exhibitions. She holds a Bachelor of Architecture with honours from the University of Auckland, a Master of Architecture by Research from the Un Victoria University of Wellington with a thesis on architectural drawing. Justine has titled her lecture tonight, Here, There and Everywhere. Please join me in welcoming Justine Clark. Thank you, Naomi, for that very kind and generous um, introduction. And People saying such nice things that perhaps I shouldn't have quit, but anyway, I did. <laughs> anyway, um, it's a bit confronting. Uh, now, when Andrew asked, invited me to speak, he suggested I could talk about my work on the local with, um, or reflect on my time as editor of Architecture Australia or not do that. In fact, I'm going to try and do all of it. Um, when I looked at the uh, flyer for the talk series, I realised that the majority of speakers in the series are practitioners of one kind or another. And so I thought I'd try and describe my work also as a kind of practice. I'm not going to claim that writing can be a kind of architecture, but I would argue that editing, writing and criticism, criticism and research might con do constitute a kind of practice and can be understood as, as modes of making. This has always seemed to me to be a productive thing to do. It requires one to reflect on the processes of production, the materiality of the work, the circumstances, geographic, economic, conceptual, under which it is made, and the effect that these have on the works in question. Considering the circumstances of making also enables us to understand the contingent as a productive part of what we've made, what we make. And for a very long time, I've been interested in the messy everydayness of any act of production and the role of serendipity, incident, and accident in... in um, sorry, I find it quite hard to see. <laughs> can we... Can that light get turned down at all? It's just... Sorry. <laughs> Maybe just... Anyway, I'll keep going. <laughs> 
Yeah, that would be good. I should have figured this out before. No. Um, it is, yeah. So if I squint, just ignore me. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, back to where I am. So I'm interested for a long time in the, the messy everydayness of making and serendipity, incident and accident. And I will reflect on that throughout the talk. But in terms of relevance to tonight's theme, I would also argue that thinking about the processes and practices of making require you to take location seriously. It provides you with an opportunity to think about where you find yourself without necessarily falling into the romanticism of genius loci and other essentialist ideas that are often associated with considerations of the local. Indeed, I'm not very interested in defining local or global architectural cultures per se. Rather, I'm interested in the contested nature of such ideas, the way that local and global architectural cultures come to be constructed and how they are invariably tightly intertwined. I'm interested in the role that writing, or history, theory and criti- that writing, history, theory and criticism and media might play in these constructions and how apparently incidental effects can have significant effect. Incidental events can have significant effects. I'm also interested in the circulation of ideas, the exchanges and interchanges that happen between and amongst places, often in quite unexpected ways. So thinking about writing, editing, and so on as a kind of practice has also helped me draw together apparently disparate kinds of activities and projects. It allows me to draw links that might help elucidate our theme tonight, and also to think about the things that I take with me, expected and unexpected, as I move from one project to another. So tonight I'm going to talk about a series of projects I've undertaken over the last 15 years, which I've always thought of as part of quite separate worlds, but which um, Andrew's theme forced me to think about together and as part of a, a kind of mode of practice. So the title of my talk is Here, There and Everywhere. And of course, here and there might relate to the global and the local of the theme. But by putting everywhere on the end, I wanted to complicate things a little bit. This everywhere opens up other kinds of issues. It refers to the way that ideas move about. It invokes media of different kinds of vehicles for the transfer of ideas. It hints at the apparent ubiquity of some aspects of contemporary architectural culture. And it alludes to the pressure on publications like Architecture Australia to be representative, to be all things to all readers. But it also has the less than positive implication of being all over the place, of being not quite focused on the matter at hand. And yet that's how my own version of practice feels day to day, especially now that I have two small children. There are always lots of different things on the go, and it feels as if many of them are dealt with in a state of distraction, while also thinking about 20 other things all at once. And I suspect that most of us now work in this way, and I've come to think, or maybe hope, that this mode of operation might also bring with it opportunities as well as costs. So tonight I'm going to talk about three main publication projects. Each relates to the theme, but along the way I want to reflect more broadly on the role of media and the transfer of ideas And as a New Zealander living in Australia and until recently editing Architecture Australia, the journal of record for Australian architecture, my own idea of what is local is is also complicated, as I think are many people's. These days, both here and there are kind of local for me, and I'm going to talk about projects in both places. So for those of you who particularly want to hear about Architecture Australia, I will get to it, and I'll get to it at some length, um, and I'm happy to answer questions at the end. But to begin with, I'm going to talk about New Zealand. So this is a book I wrote a long time ago now with Paul Walker. It was published in 2000, and it's been quite interesting for me to the last few weeks to start thinking about it again. Um, called Looking for the Local, as you can see, uh, it was explicitly about the construction of local architectural culture in post-war New Zealand and the way this was entwined, intertwined with contemporary international interest in the local. Like many other projects, it began in an accidental way. I came across a box of photographs in the Alexander Turnbull Library while curating an exhibition on Wellington's architectural centre. 
This was a group of mostly young, highly active and activist architects who had big ambitions to affect New Zealand architecture, and in particular the city of Wellington. This box captivated me and became a project of its own once the exhibition was done. It contained images of over 200 projects. They were mixed bags, there were slick photographs, there were tiny snapshots, there were faded slides, um, and there was a strange editor's list which we never found out who the author was. They were old photos of new post-war architecture, and there were many projects that we didn't know. Now, I had hoped you'd be able to read this, but my little ex- you can't, so <laughs> sorry about that. Um, the photos had been collected in the late 50s by members of the centre in an attempt to make a book about New Zealand architecture. It was modelled on various books about local modernism and circulation at the time, Brazil Builds, Sweden Builds, and it built on a very vibrant local culture of publication, but mostly pamphlets and journals. Other archival material made it clear the book did not eventuate. It collapsed under, under the pressure of defining what New Zealand architecture was, and the various intentions and ambitions that drove the project could not be resolved into a single position. Energy and enthusiasm ran out, ran out, new political and urban commitments took over, and the material was consigned to the archive, where we found it 50 years later. So the proposed book could not be con- reconstructed from these remains. It was both overwhelmingly present and strangely absent. But the vying propositions about what New Zealand was at the heart of the proposal were fascinating. They offered a way into the complex network of ideas around identity, modernism, architectural cultures, both local and international. Uh, My partner, Paul Walker, had long been interested in the entanglement of New Zealand and global architectural cultures, the circulation of ideas, and the way that New Zealand had been represented internationally from the 19th century onwards. And the gaps and tensions within the discussion of the book seemed like a very productive space in which to tease these ideas out. And so together we set about making another book from the material and intellectual traces of that first project. It interested us that the debates about what New Zealand architecture was could not be resolved in the 40s and 50s, and yet by the late 90s a very consolidated view of that period had emerged. The archival remains of the book offered a vantage point from which to reconsider our understanding of post-war architecture. They provided an invitation to recall little remembered buildings and projects, but more importantly, I think, an opportunity to situate often unstated assumptions about New Zealand modernism within their broader context. And these um, assumptions were continuing to have the very, very strong effect in, in contemporary culture, so we were kind of interested to unsettle them a bit, see what might happen. I don't know if anything did... Okay, but most interestingly for tonight, it offered the potential for a complex account of the intricate relations between local and global. It gave us the opportunity to explore the argument that places like New Zealand, and I think Australia too, are not simply at the end of a long, one-way drift from metropolitan centre to the periphery, and that ideas of the local are themselves embedded within international architectural discourse. We already had that. We pursued this in a number of ways. We explored the mediated condition of modernity, the role of publication and photography in disseminating ideas. We looked at different versions of modernism at play in the post-war period and how many of these had been erased in the years to come. Um, We were interested in the proposed content of the book because it allowed us to reintroduce some of these other versions to New Zealand architectural history and to suggest other ideas of what New Zealand could or might be. By historically locating the development of architectural commitments and ideas, we sought to demonstrate that these things were not essentially in New Zealand, but rather the outcome of contingent events and structural situations. So this is what we made. Is it? So there was an element of nationalism in that first project. Um, The argument was that uh, the quote, we believe that a collection of the best work will prove to be a great deal more impressive than is normally assumed and that it's worth making such a collection available for the delectation of New Zealanders and those abroad. quite like the idea of this idea of delight embedded in this fairly worthy project. 
Uh, this double audience reflects the more general environment of twin commitments and twin influences within which New Zealand architects operated, local and international. There was widespread cultural nationalism at play in New Zealand from 1940 onwards, and this coincided very neatly with the increasing international interest in locally inflected forms of modernism. Post-war, there was, a, and I think a lot of this is very similar to Australia. I'm not saying it's the same. I don't know the work well enough, but I think there are a lot of parallels. Post-war, there was a strong sense that New Zealand was a place where one could start anew, away from the disaster of Europe. New Zealand was still new, and in its own its very name sort of indicated this. And this newness itself was seen as a condition of modernity. There was a strong desire to define an architecture for New Zealand made by architects who considered themselves at home in that country. And the international interest in local architecture provided a framework to do this in and to be modern at, at the same time. By taking the local seriously, New Zealand architects sought to actively participate in the international architectural community on terms other than the pre-war ones of empire. Uh, okay, now I'm just going to go through... Uh, I seem missing a slide, but I have the point that, that the buildings that came out of the, this kind of search for a vernacular would have meant different things to different audiences... So um, for international readers, they would have read as local. Um, for lay New Zealanders, they read as something completely foreign. And for New Zealand architects, they read as both local and international at the same time. And I think that kind of complexity is, is kind of interesting. But I've lost my images, so... No, OK. OK, so um, I think one of the things I found when I, I read this again, which I hadn't read for such a long time, I, got, I became completely absorbed in it, so I've probably got too much stuff. I'm going to just try and skip quickly through the, um, a couple of the themes that we pulled out using these images. And so one of the set of images in the book was this um, set of snapshots of what looks like fairly ordinary, you know, kind of construction project, but it's, um, there were a group of architects in New Zealand called The Group who have very heavily mythologised in this version of what New Zealand architecture is. And so to find these images of the projects under construction was, was quite interesting. The other thing that was sitting there in this box was these, old, these other images of these kind of much earlier 19th century buildings, which led us to start thinking about um, the kind of writing of history as well. So post-war... Um, New Zealand's architectural history was being written at the same time as there was this sort of desire for, for, for a vernacular. Um, and that history was a very modernist history. It was very much about a very direct response to climate and location and material. And um, there was this uh, retrieval of these earlier forms that were described as simple, truthful and functional. So this new history was claiming an architectural modernism as a kind of national trait. Modernism in New Zealand became doubly entangled. In various occasions, the architects searching for New Zealand architecture were called new pioneers. And, of course, the term pioneer also had currency in modern architectural discourse. Uh, we have Pev Snow, the pioneers of modern movement, and many others. So it implied a new ideas as well as a new country. Um, and ideas of the vernacular particularly circulate around these architects uh, because of a manifesto they published as students, um, anyway, we've got a long chapter which I haven't really condensed very well, but I think that the kind of the, the sort of constant meshing of this desire for a local architecture and this kind of international sense of what that is in relationship with the modern is, I think, quite useful because I think too often the global and the local are positioned in these kind of oppositions. So there's the globe, you know, the local's good, the global's bad. I suppose what, everything I'm trying to do tonight is just to suggest that it's much, much more complicated. Anyway, so, and of course, you know, we have young men building buildings and it's all, you know, again. So there was also another set of images that really interested us. Um, and this um, was a quite different house, quite different images. And we really liked this photo um, and it became the cover of the book. We liked the way it worked with the paradigms of modern photography while also playing with them. The figures of the glamorous young woman in modern houses that were familiar to many of us from the work of Julius Schulman and others were here replaced by an image of an older woman, the architect's mother. But it was in fact something very minor about this house, 
which we found had had a lasting impact on architectural culture and the way it was represented internationally. So one afternoon in August 1958, this house, that carport right there, was the location of a vigorous debate between the young, opinionated architect and Nicholas Pevsner, the famous historian editor, and editor of the Architectural Review. The subject of their discussion was a post holding up the carport. Pevsner referred to this conversation a number of times, telling the story on each occasion, recasting it differently for different audiences. Sometimes he allowed that there might be some potential in what the detailing that he described as crude. Quote, maybe he was right. Maybe that robustness of detail, which strikes me as a little raw, will one day be a valid expression of the New Zealand version of 20th century architecture. But later on, when he was writing for the Canon Making Architectural Review, he left no room for such possibility. He says, lack of means is often apparent in the detailing, although a certain crudity is called straightforwardness, and at least by some of the most thoughtful young architects, set up as a new country feature in opposition to the old men's fussiness at home. It sounds convincing at first, but California is not all that old and still manages to get its details right. So this, these pieces of writing generated a huge amount of response in New Zealand, um, and they reverberate right to the 90s. There are these, um, the, the, this term straightforward becomes very, very common. And, you, and we st just started tracking all these references. And, and it became, I, don't know, I guess it really fascinated me that you know, some conversation under a carport turns up um, in the 1990s um, from um, the, art, the director of the Auckland Art Gallery commenting, a kind of colonial heritage begets directness, bluntness, in fact, a kind of colonial brutalism. And this colonial brutalism phrase had just reoccurred and occurred, which provides a strong tonic to the too-sugared spirit of European sophistication. So, yeah, in 1993, Leonard Bell then quotes that Tom Roy um, quote and, and, and gets rid of any reference to architecture, so, and it becomes a sort of state of New Zealandness. And so this discussion about a post holding up a carport in a lower hut, which is an outer suburb of Wellington, in the late 50s, then turns itself by the 1990s into a, this generalised cultural condition. And I guess um, I'm particularly interested in the way that these sort of apparently minor things take off. Okay. So standing underneath that carport, Pevsner represented the international audience the architectural centre sought and the means to reach it. He was in New Zealand collecting material for a forthcoming issue of the Architectural Review on the Commonwealth, and unfortunately that's the only image I, can, I have of that anymore. A little square there. Um, but this was not a straightforward encounter between centre and periphery. There were very complex issues of nationality um, that I'm not going to go into here. The map that these young architects wanted to locate New Zealand on was not the same as the Architectural Review's map. It was what Stanford Anderson called an axis of alternative modernism. And by, the, by the end of the 1950s, the book was intended to send something back to the world, to show New, show New Zealand's own regional inflections of this universal local. But it did not go ahead. New Zealand was not added to that map or to any other, and nor was the mapping at home completed. In the end, the book founded on an irresolvable difference between two positions. One took the view that New Zealand architecture would be discovered through an analysis of the field, threading together these various strands to suggest the diversity of the gathered photographs. The other proposed, and this happened 18 months into the book project, a focus on the small timber single-family house. So we used that debate to locate the idea that the house is a primary form of New Zealand architecture, both historically and textually, and that's still very strong. I know in Australia there's quite, you know, there's quite a focus on the house, but, but in New Zealand it's, it's very, very strong, and we have always been somewhat unsettled by that, and we wanted to kind of locate that in a way that it might then start to be dismantled, and we wanted to suggest that perhaps we might return to being interested in the urban as well, and the public realm as well as the house. So I suppose what we've tried to do all through the book was take these apparently minor incidents and kind of pull them into focus, use them to pull, pull these kind of situations into focus. 
Okay. As a building type, the house was particularly responsive to the search for modern New Zealand vernacular, and the slipperiness between house and home um, invested the house with meaning that wouldn't have adhered so easily to any other building type. There was housing shortages at that time, there was this rising cultural nationalism. All these things came together to, to give the house this particular power. Um, and as I said, the focus on the house continues, um, and the houses that were built in that period are still valorised as the most important works in New Zealand architecture. So out, by outlining this confluence of circumstance, we hope to reawaken, as I said, an ambition to be more actively involved in the discourse and debate on the urban. So this is a very, very famous house. Um, because, in fact, there was a lot of work that went on about the urban, about apartments and other most of urbanised living. There was a big fight about that, and, and that's been, that had been forgotten by historians. And indeed, one of, the, one of the things that drew the architectural centre's energy away from the book was an ongoing campaign for town planning. As part of this, one of the, mem one of the members of the centre was elected to Wellington City Council and was responsible for initiating a high-density inner-city public housing programme. Yet, despite this widespread post-war interest in, in ideas of local versions of modernism, subsequent histories have had, both internationally and locally, have had little room for these debates or for the projects they generated. And as a result, we have very few contemporary paradigms for thinking about architecture away from metropolitan centres, and none that pay attention to the intellectual debates in the so-called regions. But New Zealand, like other places, including Australia, had an active architectural discourse which was grounded in a desire to make architecture in and for that country while also interact actively interacting with discourse elsewhere. We argued that by taking local discourse and circumstance and production seriously and by considering the complex interactions between here and there over time, we might develop more nuanced ways of thinking about the local and the global now. So that was New Zealand. So I flew back to Australia having launched our book in New Zealand to find an email asking me to attend a job interview at Architecture Media. After six months there, I was working as a... I started off working on Architectural Product News, which was not a career highlight. Um, anyway, it was good, interesting. Um, after six months, I was assistant editor of Architecture Australia, Having been immersed in all these debates about the local, I knew not there, I knew very little about the local here. I did know a reasonable amount about architecture. I had some fairly considered ideas about the roles of media within architectural culture, and I knew quite a few academics. Um, but it was very hard work to start with. Um, I did learn quickly. So this, those are, that's the pile of some of the magazines that, that I've worked on that I could find on Sunday afternoon. And that's all the magazines I've worked on. One of the first things I read when I started working on, on the magazine was an essay by Philip Goad, where he described Australia as containing an archipelago of different architectural cultures. And I always found that helpful. The image of an archipelago is quite physical. It suggests distinct architectural cultures, but also the possibility of exchange between them metaphorical boats beached on various islands as participants talk and make architecture. And it suggests that together these various cultures make up a much more complicated landscape. The many approaches to Australian architecture gathered together, some closer than others, some separated by shoals and rough waters, others by calmer seas and bridges. Anyway, Australia, I learnt, has diverse architectures, reflecting varied climates, geographies, client groups and intellectual commitments. There's no cultural consensus, and architecture doesn't serve every cultural group equally. However, Australian architecture does index these multiplying differences, and Austra Architecture Australia sought to engage, and still seeks to engage, with these various architectures. And I have to say, being an outsider was incredibly useful for a long time, although there were big gaps in what I knew. I think it was very good to not be identified with any one of these groups. So AA is the latest publication in a sequence of magazines that have recorded and interpreted architecture in Australia since 1904. Flicking back over the century of, well, more than a century of publications gives an extraordinary sense of both the familiar and the foreign. The past is strange territory indeed, 
Yet the pages of these magazines reveal concerns, paradigms and commitments that are remarkable for their consistency, even as their articulation differs. For example, the ongoing discussions, both implicit and, and explicit, about what it is to build here. The journals, these are just some of my more favourite covers. Um, the journals played a fundamental role in building this country's architectural culture and, and in disseminating them both locally and internationally. These magazines have constructed an audience for Australian architecture and discourse and simultaneously they index a hundred, this, yeah, more than a century of, of, of activity. The early institute publications played a key role in mitigating distance in an apparently faraway place. They included a large amount of reportage about what was happening outside Australia and indeed outside architecture. They kept, they kept keeping readers informed about what was going on elsewhere. They also speculated about what Australian architecture was and might become. This is Charles Jenks with the dinosaur. More recent volumes are devoted to overtly Australian content and to articulating the complexities within architecture. Architectural culture is much more confident now, but the question what is Australian architecture still has value. But this value does not lie in finding an answer, simply in the way that it encourages us, us to think about what we do. So these are some of my favourite covers. That one there is thanks to Naomi. Um, so one of the things I've always liked, about the mag always liked about the magazine is that it demanded a very eclectic approach. It couldn't be doctrinaire. As a journal of record, it had to seek to engage with broad ranges of, a broad range of ways about thinking and making architecture, a diversity of building types, forms, technologies, theoretical positions. But at the same time, it couldn't possibly document everything. And I think one of the things I'm very happy about not being editor is I don't have to say no to people anymore for the moment. <laughs> Um, in the magazine, I think it was very important to, to offer a, the reader an opportunity to think across Australian architecture and to recognise and enjoy that complexity. Um, where was it? Am I going for time? Fine? Okay. So I've just got this little bit here because I was wanting to talk about making the magazine as a kind of practice, really about the kind of daily business of, of putting the magazine together, which is like any business of making, just a lot of, a lot of work and a lot of ideas. So putting together any issue involves a lot of planning, a lot of consideration and a lot of hard work, but also an element of chance. No matter the intent of the editorial team, there was al there's always a degree of serendipity at play and the results, I think, are often the better for it. As with making anything, it's partly a matter of seeing how to take advantage of unintentional or fortuitous events of recognising possibilities and of finding a way to make something out of them. No issue with the magazine is made in an ideal environment. There was never a moment of quiet when all possible content was laid out before me, allowing a singular moment of informed decision about the content of a particular issue. Rather, every issue was commissioned over time, with some decisions influenced by earlier ones and things being revised and reconsidered as I went. An issue of a magazine is not a book. It is an iterative, cumulative thing, and it makes sense over a sequence of issues as well as within any particular issue. Any issue of the magazine was also always slightly outside my control, and I, again, I think I quite like that. So I collected together a series of projects that I thought would make sense in some way. I'd commission intelligent, thoughtful reviewers who would have something productive to say. But reviewers write about projects in unexpected ways, and, you can, and, and this forms new connections within the content of the issue, connections that I hadn't thought about. The final photographs and the drawings come in and things change again. Some images are particularly striking, others are such small files we couldn't use them even if we wanted to. The designer will see an opportunity that we hadn't thought of, and then another ad booking comes in and we have to lose a page. So the balance shifts. The result is always a network of projects or ideas rather than a tightly structured exegesis on a particular theme, even in those thematic issues. In the pages of the magazine, quite different buildings rub against each other and maybe generate some sparks in the mind of the reader who brings further interests and interpretations to bear on the content. So recognising that a magazine is always an object that exceeds the intent of its editorial team is quite important. 
It doesn't mean that one throws one's hands in the air and relinquishes responsibility. It doesn't mean that you work very hard to make it make a lot of sense. But it does remind us that larger things are always at play than the intent of any particular individual or group. The magazine is a product of the culture in which it's made, and editors, authors and architects are all cultural agents. In making the magazine, I was also very conscious of its role as a journal of record and as a future resource. Having spent all that time scouring old magazines, I was quite conscious of that, you know, they have this very long shelf life. I was quite aware that publishing a project is one important way of making it available for discussion in the architectural community, and that this is one first step in the consensual communication creation, consensual communal creation of the canon. However, the consciousness of the role of the magazine in history um, also manifested itself in very small and pragmatic ways. We've put a huge amount of work into reproducing the drawings. Um, We've sort of spent a large amount of time, and I know Haig Beck probably does this even more than us, but a lot of time making sure they're reproduced properly. We're very careful about the ordering. Um, they were always reproduced at proper scales. Um, and this is all very invisible work, but I think it really distinguishes a publication that's quite serious about architecture. So that's just a little, I suppose, what we're trying to do. But of course, I, bring, I did bring baggage with me um, as I moved into Architecture Australia. And I was once told, and I quite like this, that I was not a suitable person to be editor of Architecture Australia because I didn't love Australia enough. It was about one o'clock in the morning, and I was quite drunk, I nearly cried. <laughs> anyway, I've turned into something else. <laughs> um, it transpired the problem wasn't that I was a New Zealander. The previous editor had also been a New Zealander, and that was fine. But the problem was that I was a little bit sceptical of the romantic version of Australia, in which Australian architecture is epitomised by beautifully crafted houses and stunning bush settings, or photographed as if they might be. I was also, it seems, too interested in architectural theory to be a real Australian. And as you realise from my description of the book, I kind of had various reasons for those those attitudes. Um, Which isn't to say I don't like the work, it's just I don't think it's the only work. Personal insults aside, I think that comment was particularly interesting because it pointed to the deeply entrenched but highly contested ideas about what Australian is and should be and how it should be represented. I know these are not the same as New Zealand, but they do share some characteristics. And these debates seem a little bit dated now. But I think that the House is still something of a lightning rod for debates about what constitutes architecture here. It seems that there is much more at stake in differing perceptions of the House than many other building types. And positions are polarised into fors and againsts. So I think the anti-House and the Bush position is, is in danger of becoming doctrine itself, of, become, of being an, an equally unthought, un, uncritically spouted knee-jerk reaction to these very finely crafted projects. And I don't think that polarisation is all, at all useful. I think it stops productive debate and discussion and it prevents any sophisticated appreciation of um, many projects. But then I think perhaps my interlocutor was, was right. Perhaps I don't love Australia enough but I do find it very fascinating in all its messy complexity, and I think that that was probably a much more important thing for an editor to be interested rather than besotted. Anyway, so now, this, this is a, I'm going to talk just about this one issue for a little bit. This is um, an issue I did September last year, which, again, relates fairly strongly to Andrew's theme. So our book took two and a half years to write. This magazine took two and a half months to put together. So it's a very different pace of activity and a very different kind of mode of engagement. So Architecture Australia, I think I've tried to outline, is, 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 is all, as the Journal of the Institute, is always implicitly concerned with what Australian architecture is and might be. Um, and this issue, I think, really sought to expand that understanding. So that's the cover. And this is a... I don't know if you can read. That's a detail of the cover, which... So really, it's just a sort of um, overlay of places and projects. So Australian architecture, of course, is not bound by the geographical borders of this country. There's a substantial cohort of architects and academics from this part of the world spread across the globe 
And while architects based in Australia are now working internationally on it, and architects based in Australia are now working internationally on an unprecedented scale. So this issue of the magazine sought to extend our idea of what might constitute Australian architecture, of what the local is. Relationships between here, you can see I took this one quite late on Sunday afternoon, very sharp shadows. Anyway, I, was trying to, I'm, I guess I'm trying to give a sense of these things as material objects as well. So relationships between here and there have always been intricate and complex. We've always been embedded in the give and take of architectural ideas and in the production of architectural culture. And I think a lot of the ideas that I started thinking about you know, a long time ago in New Zealand really do keep informing what I'm trying to do in a new context like the magazine. So how to commission and compile and edit a single issue of Architecture Australia on such a huge topic? So this is the... So we did these two maps. This is... Um, this is, the, this is people, and so the spots are bigger where there are more people, and um, this is projects, project locations, which are quite, you know, tell quite different stories. Okay, so the format that we usually use, um, six to ten pages of very carefully organised images and drawings with a 1,200-word independent peer review just didn't work in this context. It just didn't give us the space we needed to convey the density and the diversity of activity, the range and spread of both people and work. And so we explored some alternative strategies. It was also an incredibly tight deadline, and when, you've got a, when you're running out of time, you can't, you can't, if you can't give someone a three- or four-week deadline to write something, you find another way. So we could get people to respond to a survey very quickly. We could give them a week deadline. Unfortunately, it meant that we had a huge amount of work to do ourselves, but, and it seems to be when you've run out of time, you end up you know, coming up with this new solutions which um, I think served the material but also just about killed us. So here's the, um, uh, I'm sorry it's not very clear. So this is the project location map. Um, so we did these two maps. Um, and to gain the information we sent out emails and calls for contributions by every possible means we could think of. We asked where are you and what do you do? And a flood of material came back, which we fed into these maps. And these are in no way comprehensive. They were sort of an impressionistic crowdsourcing rather than any kind of scientific survey. But they were compelling, and we think that they do hint at a much richer array of activity. Um, yeah, sorry. The stories that accompanied these were also fascinating, and we tried to put some of them into the map. Um, we tried to include everyone who answered, but there's just this vast body of material and I think I think there's lots of potential to do something more with it. But you know, we had two and three and a half weeks, so we didn't months. Okay, so we did present some projects. Um, we tried to do it in two pages rather than our usual six to ten. Um, and that was much more complicated. So again we had to come up with new ways of doing it. So instead of commissioning reviews, we simply asked the architects a set of questions. How was the project commissioned, procured and delivered? How, what was the brief and how did you respond? What approach did you take to working across cultures in terms of process and design? What did you take away from the project? And did working on a project in this context influence how you'll work in the future? And these work quite well. I mean, when I started at Architecture Australia, there, used, there were architects' project descriptions alongside the review, which I have to say I got rid of because... Although some of them were well written, mostly they were really badly written, and they didn't seem to add much to the project. But by asking these very specific questions, I think we got a very good response, and I think it's something to made me think of revisiting that kind of model again. Because normally, we have the magazine had a, and I had a very um, firm commitment to the policy of independent peer review. I worked very hard to commission, you know, articulate thoughtful people who would have something to say productive and interesting about the project and the broader issues that it raised. We selected writers based on experience and expertise and as I said we never quite knew what they would bring to the project and that was one of the joys of the magazine is that you know, was, writers always took it in a, di a direction that I hadn't necessarily thought of. Okay, so but with this we tried something different. We also, in this page here, um, just produced a whole lot of stuff we got sent in and we weren't, um, we tried not to exercise judgment, we just put in what we got. 
And so there's a quite a mix of work which probably wouldn't normally have made it into the pages of AA, which I quite liked as well. So, so then um, we had these thematic essays which kind of provided a, a, kind of a context for all that work and for, these, for the architects' impressions of what they were doing. Um, I think the one that's really missing is... It, that didn't make it into this, into this issue was one about um, the kind of ethical complexities of working across cultures. And I think, um, you know, sometimes things just fall out. But I think, I think that would have been an important, important addition. But we've got um, Peter Johns writing about humanitarian work. We've got Bharat Davi talking about the way in which um, contemporary practice is being kind of conducted across the globe um, through documentation practices, um, and in Johnson talking about how even in one's hometown, you know, one's conducting these kind of international exchanges all the time, and of course Naomi talking about heat and export, and the person who did the ad layouts with this, I think, um, has a very wonderful sense of humour, and every now and then there's this beautiful pairing, and I think this was a good one, <laughs> so... Okay, and the other form of anecdote we had were um, architects reflecting on the way in which they practice, which enabled them to work internationally. And so we had you know, Earl Arney from, a, uh, from Woods Bag at one of massive, massive practice, and Rory Hyde sitting at his desk in Amsterdam. So again, trying to get a kind of bit of um, some diversity in. And also, I think sometimes when you just, when you have architects' own words, sometimes you let them hang themselves as well as try and make them, you know, sometimes I edit very carefully to make it all sound good every now and then. It's like, you really want to say that? Fine. It's quite, you know, so there, there were some opportunities for being a little bit um, naughty in this issue, which I quite liked. Okay, and then the day after I resigned as editor of Architecture Australia, I was asked to edit an issue of Architecture New Zealand by my bosses. I pointed out that I had in fact resigned, but they thought I could do it before I left. Um, so against my better judgment, I agreed, and I took it on with Paul Walker again, and with Peter Johns, who is a friend of mine in Melbourne, who among many things runs the website Butter Paper, which many of you will know. We were much more distant from the production of this magazine than I'm used to, and although I talk about enjoying the kind of serendipitous, I like to have quite a lot of input into layouts. This time I didn't get to. This time the publisher chose the cover, and I really don't like it. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting to be in this more distant position. The reason I don't like it is it felt to me like it was too derivative of that Architecture Australia cover. Um, and what we were trying to do with Architecture New Zealand was actually quite different um, because the, the context and the situation was different. So whereas there were a large number of... Um, a huge number of Australian architects working um, on these big projects in China and the Middle East, it didn't seem that that was quite the same situation in New Zealand. And also we weren't on the ground there, so we just didn't quite know... So we became much more interested in the um, idea of the diaspora. And my notes are completely out of order, so I just have to find those bits. Anyway, we became... And I think that it was kind of very interesting working on this issue too because we were talking about our own condition, which was very different than talking... Of, you know, than anything else had ever done, really. And it was... Um, we had a number of people wrote essays and all of them ended up writing much more anecdotally than they ever experienced. So it was, it was very interesting. Very interesting. So what we did this time is we tried to push the survey a lot further and we discovered WUFU, which let us do this online survey. Um, so we had a lot of questions, which I'd hope we might be able to read, but we can't. Um, no. Um, about, what were the questions? About when people graduated, about, well, she, about if they intended to return, about what they did. So a much, a much wider range of questions about what they thought their New Zealand background had influenced them or not. Um, and we got 200 responses. And again, we just did everything we could. And even, uh, it might just be that I was more technologically savvy by the time we did this, but even in that difference of, a, of nearly a year, the potential to find people online seemed to have moved quite remarkably. So we did it so... We also had, um, shall I go to, so we made this map. So it's another map. Um, this map is of flight paths. So this is 
we asked everybody where, not only where they were, but where they'd been. And so we construct, my colleague Peter Davies constructed this amazing map. Um, but we also had uh, Greg Moore, who is at um, RMIT, who runs a business called Oom Creative, which does this data visualisation. And we gave him the spreadsheets that we generated and suggested that he make another kind of interpretation out of that. So we were trying to kind of push the mapping thing a lot further. So we've got two, I mean, there are only, well, for a long time, there are only two schools of architecture in New Zealand, and now I think there are, are there four or three? Anyway, three, I think. So these two white centres are the universities, um, and then there are places and other places of study. Um, and it's just, just, I just sort of don't entirely understand it, but I really kind of like <laughs> kind of just get completely drawn into it. So you get these, you end up building these clusters, which are kind of about three or four things interacting, which is, I suppose, what data visualisation allows you to do, rather than the sort of one or two dimensional analysis. Um, and then with the projects, we were, uh, we originally planned to do the two-page coverage. We couldn't even, didn't even have space for that. Um, and we really liked a whole lot of the stuff we got. So we just did these, again, this was Peter Davies, did these very intense um, pages. And I think when we were trying not to say this is what New Zealand architecture is. Um, we were trying to say, I guess we really liked the complexity and the diversity rather than it becoming, you know, trying to essentialise one thing or the other. But we liked the fact that all these 200 people had gone out into the world and made these kind of remarkable things. So, I'm trying to. And the other, uh, I think I had fantasies about how this was going to work. <laughs> uh, clearly, I just like slides, they project, you know what you've got. Anyway, don't have slides anymore. Um, so the other thing we did was we, had, was we had this massive survey material that was full of these great quotations. Um, and so we spent a very, very, very long time filtering, but, um, we try to really have people's, have people's words in response to these various themes kind of have quite a strong presence. Uh, no, I'm not going to do that yet. Okay. And so in the spirit of this quotation, I'm just going to read a couple of things from the various essays that we had, one of which is by... Um, oh, I guess the other thing I want to say is that uh, one of the reasons we focused on the diaspora is that although no one knows how many New Zealanders live abroad, it seems that New Zealand is the developed country with the largest percentage of its population living overseas. And this seems to have a fairly significant impact, but we don't know what it is. And there are economists doing diaspora studies. So there's this very strong sense that it must have some impact and that brain drain is a fairly unsophisticated way to think about it. Um, and Paul read a lot of this economic stuff on the diaspora, and I didn't, so I'm not going to talk about it. But um, it just seems to us there's something really quite interesting there. And, and, I, and it was very strange to be working on something that was personally also so close to us. So one of the essays we had was by um, someone called Stephen Cairns, who used to be at uh, Melbourne Uni for a long time. Prior to that, he was in New Zealand, and now he's in Edinburgh. And he wrote, as for all nations that face the problem of brain drain, the issue is not one of stemming the flow, but how to remain integrated and to draw energy from those flows. It's a matter of how a nation builds, activates and sustains the infrastructures of connectivity that ensure it draws together its talents in and through the state of being worldly. And I think that, that is quite, quite useful. And again, I think in, in Paul's essay, he was really trying to speculate about how, how the profession might actually use this vast diaspora, how, we might, how it might kind of engage with it, rather than just kind of going, oh, you've gone away, so you're not relevant anymore, which, you know, the Institute doesn't send architecture New Zealand to anyone outside New Zealand, which kind of tends to cut off that sort of discussion. Okay, you can... Um, and, of course, as we were doing this, it, the earthquake in Christchurch happened, and so suddenly... Again, um, the sort of very visceral response to being a New Zealander was, was you know, we were all sort of thinking abstractly and suddenly, you know, the, this ta the town I was born in was flattened. So, um, I didn't know it affected <laughs> anyway, so, so, all these kind of things started to happen that were, that were kind of interesting. And so, again, Stephen talks about this. 
On that day, as I walked through these London corridors and foyers, navigated up and down those London stairs and moved in and out of these London doors and lifts, he was in London, not Edinburgh, obviously, I encountered an unexpected part of my architectural self, an almost forgotten and certainly recently unused self. In the wake of that distance Christchurch disaster, I looked upon all those London spaces with different eyes. It was not simply that I wondered what it would be like to be in an earthquake and to experience the architecture around you shake, fold and break. I was suddenly seeing all those London spaces through one very specific architectural lens that I had acquired during my undergraduate education at the School of Architecture in Auckland. The earthquake proofing of buildings through principles of bracing, stiffening, bundling and base isolation were, I imagine, prominent in the training for all architecture students in New Zealand. And it's a fact of life that certain pieces of knowledge can be rendered redundant by being displaced in space and time. Think of the migrant professional who can no longer use his or her credentials in their new home. And yet it's also true that other forms of knowledge can be established, can, can be enhanced and given new value through processes of mobility and migration. And I think what was interesting too is the various essays. Um, so Stephen is... You know, he's a post-colonial theorist, he's very, a very sophisticated thinker. Um, the essay by Peter Johns, who was one of my get, co-guest editors, was much more sort of immediate responses to the data and, to his, and again to his own experiences. They both didn't plan to write autobiographical essays, but that's what kind of came out, which I think, again, they both felt relatively unsettled by. So Peter writes about butter paper. Four years into my migration... To, to Melbourne, the lack of access to a New Zealand conversation and the expenses of phone calls and flights left me feeling disconnected. These feelings coincided with a surge in the growth of the internet, and looking around the web, I realised that this platform might enable me to reacquaint myself a little with the homeland and with architectural discourse in general. In early 2000, butterpaper.com was launched, with hopes of tying together architectural news and resources from both sides of the Tasman to throw some ropes across. The website certainly led to a re-engagement with architecture. But disappointing for me, the interest was from within Australia and far-flung places like the US, Italy and Spain. Despite the New Zealand content, it never received many New Zealand visitors. Perhaps it was not quite kosher for me to post New Zealand news from Melbourne, not that that stopped me. Building that homesick website and then writing it opened doors in my career that I could not have predicted but my business is broadened to include web design and writing, who would have thought? The jolt of a physical and cultural shift seems to have bumped a few of our respondents straight out of architecture. Landing in a different city inserts you randomly into a different crowd with different interests. So many of the respondents to the survey were still working in architecture, but there were 20% who were working in the arts and construction and digital services and in the media. And indeed, Australia seems to have a habit of importing New Zealanders to edit its magazines. So you have me, you have Davina Jackson, Matt Ward, the editor of AR, is a New Zealander, Jackie Q, who was the editor of Monument for a while, is a New Zealander, so I don't quite know what's going on, but, you know, I don't know. Okay, and the last thing, I'm going to go back to modernism. So, um, again, quote, this is from, from Paul and his essay in that issue. Um... Paul tried very hard not to write biographically, to try and write about the sort of structural situations. Um, and he saw something very important in the survey respondents who talked about the scale of operations of New Zealand offices and the close, if even troubled, relationship of architecture to building practice in New Zealand and the way that that shapes architectural skills and focuses careers in particular ways. So a lot of people commented in their, in their responses that they didn't feel that their design the way that the, the sort of form or the, whatever qualities of the design had in it was influenced by the New Zealand, their being New Zealanders, but they felt that perhaps the process did and the familiarity with, with building processes. So Paul um, talks about this in relation to Connell Ward and Lucas, a um, very famous firm in London in the 30s. He points out that the culture of architecture has long been globalised through the dissemination of publication and that the material conditions of architecture from place to... Sorry. So his point is that, that, that the culture is globalised through publication, but that the material conditions of architecture from place to place are nevertheless particular. 
But the technique that's normative in one location may be, turn out to be full of innovative potential in another. So this is another kind of jolting. So um, Basil Ward and Amias Connell were both New Zealanders who went to London. They'd learnt about modernism in New Zealand in the 30s in Napier, which is another somewhere after the earthquake. Um, they went to New Zealand. Uh, they went to, sorry, they went to London. I'm very confused here. Anyway, but they knew about concrete. They knew about concrete construction because of earthquakes in New Zealand. And so this thing, which was this very prosaic, everyday thing in, um, in New Zealand, in London was this kind of, in the 30s, where it was this kind of majorly innovative thing. So the knowledge that they took with them, um, they put to great effect in differentiating their design work from the English architectural scene in the 1930s. So going back to New Zealand, has always been conscious of its relationship with architecture elsewhere, Paul says. The examples of Connell and Ward show that it's something more complicated, motivated by their encounters with architectural modernism and publications that the flow of modernity had already brought to New Zealand in the early 20th century. Connell and Ward went to what they thought were its sources. They brought with them their almost incidental knowledge of modern technique, its effects, and its effects in the hidebound English context were quite unexpected, and they became, you know, this leading, leading modernists. The possibility of such a productive disjunction is surely enhanced by our current contemporary global world. So that's all a bit hairy at the end, sorry. Um, one more quote. One of the things that many of our respondents talked about was education and the fact that they had a very good education, and I think that that's... So I guess here we are at the School of Architecture at UQ. I thought I might end by talking about the value of education. And again, um, I think Stephen Cairns just summed it up what certainly my recollection of being trained in Auckland and what many of our respondents' uh, recollection was too. And he says, I recall the Auckland School where I did my undergraduate training to be a lively design environment with a rich studio life. More specifically, the work to articulate the possibilities of a bicultural, multicultural New Zealand were very important. These were by no means stable and prescripted principles. They were points of debate and contention that seemed to have consequences for architecture and appropriate forms of settlement in New Zealand and beyond. The particular combination of drawing, cultural, political sensibility, um, the kind of very strong interest at that time and in, in contemporary architectural theory um, was and I think remains fairly unique. It was perhaps the openness of Auckland, the university and other cultural institutions in that city as a site of debate that has been most significant. It was really a place where some pre-existing sense of New Zealandness was merely asserted. It was a place where that was constantly being negotiated through art, films, buildings and the everyday life of the city. And I guess that's where I would like to end with this idea that um, we, as a sort of constant negotiation and renegotiation of what it is to be in a place and what it is to engage with a kind of broader discourse that I think is very important. So there we go. Been. Um, I, I guess my question's about the Architecture Australia business, and because and, you know, I've got an interest in the institute and I've got yeah. to hang around the university library, mm. I quite like the idea of the history of Australia being recorded. Mm. And, and I was just wondering how often you need to look over your shoulder in Architecture Australia to see what else is going on. Through history, transitions, then monument, then Architecture Review Australia, uh, you, you, mm. you, me, uh, have taken at various stages, a, a sort of a more active role in discussing yeah. architecture. Uh, and then over time, houses, artichoke, have, have stripped yeah. away some of the content of Architecture Australia. Yeah. And in the current realm, a lot of the interest in contemporary projects is people pursue through, through websites. So, so how, how important is it for Architecture Australia to follow a, a, you know, a kind of a straight line? And, and how important is it for it to react against what else is happening in, in, the, in society as, as a journal of record. 
I mean, I, I, I mean, I think there are, there are projects which are major public projects that have to be reviewed in the Journal of Record. They're kind of no-brainers. They have, you know, and then I think there's all this room around those projects for a whole lot more stuff. And I think one of the things I would like to have done and, and, and found I couldn't do was, was really expand that side of it a lot more and, and, and because it, it's very important to review the you know, straightforward public projects, but I think you know, kind of engaging in a much more diverse sense of what architecture is and might be is, is, much, is very important as well. I mean, of course, we're always looking at what other people are doing, and when, when I started, we didn't publish a project that had been published anywhere else. Um, Given that our readership was so much bigger, I thought that was a bit silly. And, and again, given that I had the sense of how one might use magazines over time. So, again, kind of really significant, well, how do you define what significant, but, you know, significant projects would, would get covered. I think it's important to have different writers. I think it's important to have different photography. I think, um, I mean, I guess when I'm not being... I mean, the magazine's under a lot of commercial pressures, and that's where the thing about not publishing something someone else comes from someone else has already done comes from. But I think the um, I think it's important to have multiple stories about things in the public realm. So and I think the the rise of, of the web um, and social media is, is fascinating. And I think um, so I mean I've never really liked that thing of having to get the latest, greatest first and getting the scoop. It's just a side of find less least interesting. Um, and in some ways that we don't, that pressure is now kind of gone because it, you've already seen the photos, but I think it's what you say and what you can do with it. And so it's really important to have very good writing. It's much more important than it was when I started, I suppose, commercially. So, I mean, the magazine is entirely funded through advertising, so, and that has a, you know, the, it's the journal of the Institute, but we get no money from the Institute, which no one, well, we, we didn't, well, <laughs> the magazine I used to edit doesn't. <laughs> um, so I think that, uh, no, no one quite registers that, but we're not subsidised, so it's that has. A, it, they don't tell us what they don't tell the magazine. Advertisers don't tell the mag magazine what to publish, but the kinds of coverage and the look and the feel and the big glamorous photos and all that stuff is very much targeted. You know, it has to be a magazine that an advertiser wants to be in. So. I'm just after an opinion on, uh, the, I suppose, the death of printed media with respect to um, digital publications and the embedded um, videos that now mm. give instant gratification to um, our understanding of architecture as opposed to a more academic reading of text, plans and photographs. Well, I guess... I guess I like both. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think actually video has an enormous potential to change the way we understand projects. I think the web's remarkable in that way. I think the, the potential is, you know, I mean, I know um, Lions have had um, Matthew Sleeth photograph a whole of their buildings running, uh, following his two-year-old son round at that eye level. And, you know, so I think that it's not just about instant gratification. I think there's all sorts of opportunity that opens up out of that. I mean, I guess I... I'm very fond of print, and I suppose, again, I worry about the archival situation with, you know, how do we... I mean, I've, I've got stuff on zip drives I can't access anymore. I've got books that I can. So um, I, think there's, I think there's great opportunities in both mediums, and I think what you have to do is build um, very strong links between those media. I think some... I don't think Architecture Australia does it well, but I think some publications do, and I think there's a huge amount of opportunity for, for building a kind, of, um, a kind of synergy, I guess, between different media. I don't know, maybe print will go, but I don't know, we'll see. I'm, it's something I'm quite interested in. So. Shall we go and have a drink? God, I don't know. <laughs> I get it's staying alive. <laughs> um, I'm not sure because it's interesting when I did that. I sort of looked at issues I hadn't thought about for a long time. And, you know, it's kind of nice to be surprised. Like, some of them I'm... So yeah, I'm not sure. But, I mean, some of those covers I don't... You know, they're not my decisions. Some of those covers were not the cover I wanted for that issue. 
some of them I love, um, but there might be other content in those. Issues. So again, it, it is made, you know, the magazine is made in this kind of constant negotiation, and, it's, and it goes into the world and it's subject to more negotiation, so, you know, I, I like that, but then with Architecture New Zealand, it's completely outside my control, I didn't like it at all. <laughs> so.